Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. You made a fool of me. But them broken dreams have got to end. Hey, woman, you got the blues, cause you ain't got no one else to use. I hit the button on the radio, changing to one of those all-night talk shows that ramble on about seeing Bigfoot or UFOs. I had heard that same song repeatedly in the last few hours, and I was sick of hearing it. Why, you ask? Simple, it reminded me too much of the woman I walked away from. I take that back. I didn't walk. I ran. Let me start from the beginning. My name is Stan Shipman, and for the last five years, I've been married to Lucy, formerly Lucy Dalton. We were sweethearts in high school and I thought we were soulmates. We married right out of high school. Yeah, a big mistake. I know. But we were so much in love with each other we thought we could make an honest go of it. Boy, was I wrong. Money wasn't an issue. I'm a welder by trade, been doing it since I was a kid. My dad was a welder and he taught me everything I needed to know. I've been putting metal together since I was big enough to handle a welder safely. I always wanted to join my dad on job sites when I was younger, but couldn't. Union rules and insurance regulations prevented it. But my dad did fabrication at home on the side and he was always giving me stuff to do. It was a great learning experience for me and I enjoyed doing it. I went to school for welding after I graduated from high school, but got bored with the classes since I already knew all this shit. So I tested out, blowing all the instructors away. I got my certificate and went straight to work. Because I already had lots of experience and could do fabrication and fitting in addition to welding, I got paid good money, especially when I had to travel for big jobs out of state. I even did underwater welding and made a ton of money doing that. I made enough to put Lucy through college and now she's a paralegal working for some hotshot law firm downtown. So why am I running? And why am I now on the freeway in the middle of the night? The answer to that is the two-legged creature I married and her evil friend. Oh yeah, Lucy was all sweetness and light when we were younger. But things have a way of changing, and they did. Don't get me wrong. I love the woman, and I was more than happy to pay for her college. Her parents were convinced I'd have to go into hock up to my neck to make it happen. They underestimated me, though, big time. They were just as proud of me as they were of her the day she graduated. Better yet, she graduated without having a dime of student debt to pay back thanks to me. But things went to shit after she started working for the law firm of McMaster and Fredericks. The first couple months were okay, but as time went on, they got worse. To start with, some of her female colleagues were, for lack of a better phrase, a bad influence on her. Lucy began going out with them for a girls' night out, once a week, usually on Wednesday nights. I didn't mind at first, since she was normally home early enough for us to enjoy the evening together and I was frequently away on a job site busting my bum. But as time went on, she started going out Wednesday and Friday nights. What pissed me off was that Fridays used to be our date night. When I reminded Lucy, her response was, we can always go out on Saturdays. I deserve this time with friends. Then she started staying out later and later. It got to the point that she was out until early Saturday morning. If I tried calling her number to see if she was alright, the call always went to voicemail. I finally had had enough and sat her down to talk about it. We need to talk. I said one Saturday morning over coffee. About what? She asked. These Friday night parties of yours, I said. Friday used to be our date nights. But lately, you've been out until nearly 4 a.m. Saturday mornings. What the hell's going on? I hardly ever see you anymore. The girl's from the office, and I like to go out and unwind with a few drinks, she said. And sometimes we dance. That's all. I know those clubs are usually closed by 1 a.m. at the latest, I told her. But you've been out a lot later than that. What's going on? Are you seeing someone else? Of course not, she said with a heavy sigh. If you really must know, we sometimes go get a bite to eat afterward. Yeah, but until 4 a.m.? I asked. Sometimes, Lucy said. Well, this shit needs to stop, I told her. You have to make a decision. You're either my wife or their friend. They already see you more than I do. I didn't mind one night with the girls, but I feel like you're taking advantage of me. I'm sorry, she said. If you want... I'll stop going out with the girls on Fridays. I think that would be a good idea, I said. That way we can maybe spend some time together. She nodded her head in agreement and went to take a shower. I took the opportunity to grab her phone out of her purse and installed a phone finder app so I could keep track of where she was. Part of me hated doing it, but I felt as though I needed to, just for my own peace of mind. Things were okay for a few weeks, but Lucy went right back into her old habits and soon, she was right back to going out on Wednesday and Friday nights. I had to find out what the hell was going on, 
so I fired up the Phone Finder app and figured out where she was. After I got off work that Friday, I cleaned up a bit, then headed to the club where she and her friends were. It wasn't really much of a club, more like a bar with a DJ and a dance floor. I walked in and spotted her right off, sitting with a group of about four women and three men. I noticed that Lucy was pretty chummy with one guy sitting next to her. Too chummy, if you know what I mean. I also noticed she was wearing something much sexier than she had put on that morning. They were completely oblivious to my presence until I was right at their table. Everyone but Lucy looked up at me and the guy next to her spoke up. What do you want? He asked, putting on an attitude as if he was going to kick my butt. I just got off work and thought I'd get a beer, I said, causing Lucy to look up at me surprised. So here I walk into this bar and look what I find. Aren't you going to introduce me to your friends? Lucy looked around, nervous. She was obviously embarrassed. Everybody, she said. This is Stan. He's my husband, she added as an afterthought. Stan, this is everybody. Well, hello, everybody, I said sarcastically. I saw that she wasn't wearing her wedding or engagement rings. Did you happen to forget something? She saw that I was looking at her left hand. I, uh, took my rings off so I wouldn't lose them, she said. Bullshit, I thought to myself. But I decided not to push it. I see, I said. The guy next to her stood up and puffed out his chest. He offered a hand, so I took it. Jake, he said. Jake Rollins. Lucy and I work together. A lot, he added with a smirk. The others chuckled a bit, except for Lucy. He squeezed my hand in a vain attempt to intimidate me and establish himself as the alpha male. He wasn't able to, so I returned the squeeze and did my best to crush his soft, effeminate hand in mine. I could see he was in pain, so I let up. I was just gonna ask your wife to dance, if that's all right, he said, rubbing his hand. I looked at Lucy. Is that right? I asked her. She looked at me and slowly nodded her head. I thought this might be a chance to get some insight into what was really going on, so I nodded my head and gave him permission. Yeah, I said. Just watch your hands. And know that's my wife and I will be watching you. He nodded his head as Lucy scooted out of her seat. After she was up, I sat in the seat formerly occupied by Jake and ordered a beer. Most of the others had already left for parts unknown. You don't own her, you know, the girl next to me said as I waited for my beer. And you are? I asked. Marie, she said. Marie Compton. I've been mentoring Lucy a bit. You know, show her the ropes, that kind of thing. So, Marie, Marie Compton, I said, taking a jab at the way she and Jake introduced themselves. Who are you that I need to take marriage advice from? I'm Lucy's friend, and like I said, I'm mentoring her, she said, taking a sip of her drink. The partners like her work, and they have big plans for her. I didn't like her smug attitude and wondered what kind of bullshit she's feeding Lucy. Well, Marie, I said, I never said I own Lucy, but I am her husband. If there's something going on that's interfering with our marriage, I need to know about it. The truth is, Stan, Lucy needs to expand her horizons a bit, Marie said. All she's ever known is college and you. She needs to, you know, spread her wings a little. Broaden her horizons and spread her wings, huh? I asked. Anything else she needs to spread? Like maybe her legs. There's no need to be crude, Marie said. But since you mention it, yes, maybe she needs to experience other things. Of course, you'll benefit in the long run. Oh, how? I asked. Well, maybe she'll learn a thing or two that she can bring home to you, Marie said with a smile. After all, you're probably getting some on the side when you go away for jobs, aren't you? No, Marie, I don't, I said. I go to work, I bust my butt, I put in my hours, get paid, then come home. I love Lucy and I'd never do anything to hurt her or put my marriage in jeopardy. Well, maybe it's you who needs to broaden your horizons a bit, she said with a smirk. I take my wedding vows very seriously, I said. And I trust Lucy to do the same. I don't see any rings on your finger. Have you ever been married? A couple times, actually, she said. Let me guess, your husbands caught you cheating on them, didn't they? I asked. She shrugged her shoulders. Yeah, so? No one owns me. I do what I want with whomever I want. Well, Lucy's taken, and I expect you to respect that, I said. She chuckled. Yeah, you keep right on thinking that, she said. By then, Jake and Lucy returned from the dance floor. I stood up to let Lucy sit between me and Marie. I sat down keeping Jake from sitting next to her. He didn't look too happy, but I didn't really give a shit. So, Lucy tells me you're a welder. What do welders make these days? $15 an hour. Actually, I make over $35 an hour, more, if I have to work underwater. 
Didn't Lucy tell you I paid her way through college? You're paying her student loan, then? He asked. No, she has no student loan because I paid her way. I also bought that new Toyota for her. Damn, I didn't know welders made that much. I'm in the wrong racket. I bet you get lots of women on the side when you go out of town, huh? He asked, poking me with his elbow. No, I work when I go out of town. I typically work 16 hours a day when I'm on a job site. Like I told Marie, I take my wedding vows very seriously. I'm sure you do, Jake said smugly. I didn't like the direction this was going and these people were beginning to royally piss me off. I turned to my wife. Did you drive here tonight? I asked her. Yes, she said. Good, because I've had about as much fun as I can stand here tonight. I'm going home. I expect to see you close behind me. I started to get up and accidentally knocked my nearly full ice-cold beer into Jake's lap, coating the crotch of his khaki trousers. Oops, sorry about that. Guess you'd better get home and change your britches. He jumped up, furious, and looked like he was going to take a swing. You'd better make it count, pal, because I will put your dick in the dirt when I get up. He saw the look in my eyes and backed down. Smart move, I told him. I turned back to my wife. You coming? I'm right behind you, she said quietly. I noticed the look Marie was giving me. Believe me, if looks could kill, I would probably already be dead. I headed out the door, not looking behind me. Lucy pulled into the driveway a few minutes after I did. Good for her, I thought. I grabbed a beer from the fridge and waited for her in the living room. She stormed in, her face red. What the hell was that all about? You embarrassed the hell out of me. I embarrassed you? I asked rhetorically. Are you following me or something? She asked. I shook my head. No. I was actually just looking to grab a beer and I was surprised to see you there with your friends from work, I said, realizing that I had just lied to her for the first time since I had known her. If anyone had any reason to be embarrassed, it was me. Imagine what went through my head when I saw my wife, the love of my life, and my best friend in the world sitting there with some sex hound acting like a giddy schoolgirl. Then imagine how I felt when I saw you had removed your wedding ring. It was like you were embarrassed to admit you're married to me. Is that it? Her face softened and she sat down next to me. Of course not. It's just that I have to work with these people and Jake is the attorney I work with the most. And Marie? What's her role? She's higher up in the food chain than I am. She's been mentoring me, showing me the ropes. Does that include marital advice? I asked her. What do you mean? She asked. Well, while you and Jake were dancing, she was telling me a bunch of crap about how you need to broaden your horizons and spread your wings. I asked if that meant spreading your legs as well and she all but admitted you had and would going forward. Be honest with me. Have you cheated on me? No, I haven't, she said, looking down. For some reason she couldn't look me in the eye. Was she lying to me? I hope not. Because you know that's the one thing I could never forgive, I told her. Well, Marie has said it's possible you're getting some while you're gone, are you? No, we've known each other, what, since the sixth grade. Have you ever known me to be unfaithful to you, ever? She shook her head. No, she said quietly. I have never cheated on you, and I never intend to. I love you too much to disrespect and hurt you like that. Besides, when I'm gone, I'm too busy working. I wasn't kidding when I told Jake I often work 16 hours a day. I know, I've seen your pay stubs. There you go, what do you think put you through college? Bought you that new car out there? Kept you in nice clothes all that time? That's on top of paying our normal bills. You know, I've been saving up to put a nice down payment on a house. So you can tell Marie to shove her bullshit up her arse and shut the hell up about things she knows nothing about. You didn't care for her much, did you? Lucy asked. No, not at all. I don't like the bullshit she's been feeding you. Same with Jake. I don't trust either one of them. You know she's been divorced twice? For cheating. Lucy looked at me, shocked. How do you know that? She asked. She told me, seemed awful proud of it, too. I get the feeling the two of them are up to something and they intend to bring you down with them. You haven't done anything wrong, have you? No, Stan, I haven't. It's just... Just what? I asked her. I enjoy going out with them, she told me. Well, I enjoy going out with you as well. Think you could start spending some time with your husband? Of course, she said, wrapping her arms around my neck. I'm sorry. That's okay. You know there's only three things I've ever wanted in life. What's that? She asked. First, to be married to you. The second, to be the best welder around. And the third, to have a family with you. She smiled as she snuggled in closer to me. Well, you got the first two. Want to work on the third? It was my turn to smile. Let's go, I said. We ran into the master bedroom and spent the rest of the night making love. 
things seemed to settle down for another couple months. Lucy stayed home on Fridays, and I made a special effort to be more attentive and loving. I purposefully didn't mention Marie or Jake again since I trusted Lucy to do the right thing. Then it happened. I came home one Friday night and found the house dark except for some lit candles on the dining room table. I could smell lasagna from the kitchen and figured Lucy had something special planned out. I went into the dining room and saw she had our best china set on the table. When I turned around, I saw her, my lovely wife, wearing one of the shortest dresses I had ever seen. I loved looking at her legs, and she knew it, so she had chosen a dress that made sure I got a good view of her best features. The front of the dress was little more than two panels that barely covered her B-cup breasts. The dress was completely backless. She came to me and wrapped her arms around me, giving me a deep tongue kiss. Tonight was already looking good. Do you like what you see? She asked. I nodded my head. Oh yeah, I said, taking in her lovely form. I'm glad. Tonight's going to be very special. Why's that? I asked. It's a surprise. Go get cleaned up, then take a seat while I get dinner. I went into the master bedroom and cleaned up, changing out of my work clothes. By the time, I had got washed up and back into the dining room. Lucy had the lasagna served up and had even poured us each a glass of wine. I loved Lucy's cooking, and I especially enjoyed her lasagna, which was always dripping with cheese and filled with meat and mushrooms. I don't know which is more tempting, you or the lasagna, I said when I sat down. She giggled as she sat down. Well, I hope you enjoy both tonight, she said with a smile. I dug into my lasagna and it was delicious, as always. I took a few sips of my wine, not wanting to get too buzzed for the sex I knew would be coming later. After I finished everything, I found myself feeling just a bit strange. I tried to stand up, but I was so dizzy I nearly fell down. I looked at Lucy, confused. What had she done? I asked myself. I tried to speak, but found it very difficult. Wah. I began, but the next thing I knew, I was falling to the floor. When I finally came around, I found myself naked, secured to a chair in our bedroom. My arms were zip-tied to the arms of the chair and my legs were similarly zip-tied. There was a contraption around my waist and my tool was stuck inside a strange-looking tube. What the hell was this? I asked myself. I was royally pissed off and yelled out. Lucy! I shouted. What the hell is going on? A few moments later, Lucy walked into the bedroom, but she wasn't alone. Marie was with her. What kind of bullshit is this? I asked. Get me the hell out of this chair. Now. I'm sorry, sweetie. Marie said it was best. Best for what? I demanded. So you can see your wife expand her horizons, Marie said calmly. And her legs. Was it your idea to drug me and tie me to this chair? I asked. Of course. Lucy told me you'd never go along willingly. So I gave her something to put you out for a while. This way you can watch your wife cuck you. And there won't be a thing you can do to stop it. I looked at Lucy, madder than I had ever been in my life. And you went along with this shit? You know what this means. I'm really sorry, but Marie said it was the only way. Trust me. Please. This won't affect us at all. It's only sex. I still love you. Marie said that most married men fantasize about this kind of thing. Well, I don't and never have. And yes, it does affect us. I told you I wouldn't stand for any cheating. And what the hell is this thing you put on me? I asked her. It's called a meat cage. It's designed to give me complete control over you and let you know who's in charge of our marriage. I swear to God, I have never fantasized about this and I promise you that if you don't untie me from this chair and get this thing off me right now, we are finished. Please don't be that way. It's just one night. I'll let you loose when we're finished. I shook my head. You're not this stupid. Lucy, cut me loose right now. Marie walked over to me with something in her hand. The next thing I knew, she had put some kind of a ball in my mouth that kept me from speaking. You need to be quiet and let your wife get screwed by a real man. Or two. I shook my head to try to keep her from putting the gag in my mouth, but wasn't successful. I tried everything I could to break out of the chair, but wasn't able to. Marie stood up and walked to the door of the bedroom. Jake and another man from her office came into the room and looked at me, chuckling. Well, well, the cuck is ready for his initiation? He is, but he's not being very cooperative. Really? This might help. He reared back and hit me across the face with his fist. Then he hit me again. I could taste blood in my mouth. I was seeing red by now. Don't hurt him. Lucy screamed. You promised me you wouldn't hurt him. I owe him for ruining my pants. Now he's gonna watch as I screw his wife. With that, he reached up and tore Lucy's dress off. Get those panties off, he told her. I shook my head, 
but Lucy dropped her panties and handed them to Jake, who sniffed the crotch before tossing them at me. As I watched, Lucy got on her knees in front of Jake and began giving him a BJ while looking me in the eye. I was trembling with rage. Jake and Marie laughed as they saw my discomfort. Your wife is good at this, Jake said. Soon, Jake erupted in Lucy's mouth and as I watched, she looked into Marie's camera and smiled. Something about the way she did that indicated it wasn't the first time she had done it with him. Lucy wasn't finished, however, and began giving the other man a BJ. I thought I was going to get sick watching her. You like watching your wife with other men, don't you? Marie asked as she recorded the action. Admit it, she said. I shook my head and stared daggers at her. After Lucy finished the second man, Jake guided her to the bed. It's time for the main attraction, he said, glancing at me. As I watched, Jake started having sex with her. I closed my eyes as Lucy moaned. Do it, she said. Anytime, Jake growled as he pushed inside her. Oh God, that feels so good, Lucy said. Better than your husband? He asked. Oh yes, so much better, Lucy said as tears fell down my cheeks. At that moment, whatever love I had for Lucy was gone. I've read stories where husbands got hard watching their wives get drilled, but all I felt was hatred. I tried to keep my eyes off of them, tried to focus on something else, but it was hard. By now, Jake was doing Lucy for all he was worth. All three switched places. For the next hour, the three of them had a grand time doing everything they could as Marie recorded the whole thing. After Jake finished inside her for the second time, they got off the bed and walked over to me. Did you enjoy the show, honey? All of them laughed. That wasn't so bad, was it, Marie said. Jake and the other man pushed Marie and Lucy out of the way. Make sure you get this, Jake said to Marie. The next thing I knew, the two men peed on me, making sure to coat my face with their piss. I thought I was going to throw up. Lucy laughed as they pissed on me. When they finished, Jake leaned over to me. If you say or do anything, cuck, I swear I'll make your life a living hell, he said. From now on, your wife belongs to me. I'll come over whenever I want and do whatever I want. You got me. He stood up and motioned to the other man. Come on, let's go, he said. After they left, Marie came over to me. Don't even think of causing any problems. Jake wasn't kidding. This was child's play compared to what we could do to you. Understand? She stood up and looked at Lucy. Wait till I'm gone, then let him loose. If he gives you any shit, call me. Lucy nodded her head in understanding. After Marie left, Lucy took the gag out of my mouth and cut the ties holding me to the chair. Then she grabbed a key off a nightstand and took the cage off of me. She started to say something but I cut her off, put my clothes on, and went to the phone. What are you doing? She asked as I dialed 911. I may be a welder, but I'm not stupid. I knew that what she and her cohorts did was highly illegal and I intended to see them in jail that very night. Lucy freaked out as she realized I had just called the cops and reported a sexual assault with illegal detention. I grabbed Lucy's phone to keep her from calling Marie. I also took her keys out of her purse to keep her from driving off. She tried to take her phone and keys out of my hands, but I was able to keep them from her and put them in my pants pocket. When I ended the call, I sat down and waited for the cops. I knew they would want to examine me and take samples of the body fluid for evidence. Please don't press charges. I don't want to go to jail. Trust me. After what you have done, that's the safest place for you right now. If I could have it my way, you would never reach jail. Hell, I would have made sure you prayed for Grim Reaper, but I would not let you go. Unfortunately, I don't want to go to jail myself, so you might as well get dressed. The cops will be here any minute. You heard what Jake and Marie said. They mean it. You don't want to mess with them. Get dressed, I told her. Lucy saw the look on my face and knew better than to push me. She quietly put her clothes on and I felt her phone buzz in my pocket. I pulled it out and saw that Marie had sent a text. Everything okay? Marie's text read. Everything is fine. I wrote. He's not too happy, but he'll deal with it. I sent the message, hoping Marie would fall for the deception. I put the phone back in my pocket. By the time Lucy came into the front room, the cops had arrived. I opened the door and let them inside. It only took one look at my face to know that things weren't good. One of the officers took my statement while the other officer talked to Lucy in the bedroom. The officer taking my statement called for an ambulance and took swabs of the stuff on my face, placing them inside evidence bags. The second officer came back out and they conferred for a few minutes outside the front door before returning. When they did, the second officer went into the bedroom and came out with Lucy. Her arms were behind her back and she was crying. Please don't let them arrest me, it was supposed to be just in fun. I shook my head and turned away from her. 
By then, two more cop cars showed up along with an ambulance. A female cop showed up at the door and took Lucy. The cop who took my statement said she was under arrest for illegal detention, drugging me, and sexual assault. We'd like to have you checked out at the hospital. We'll need to get samples of your blood and urine to determine what they dosed you with. I thought about arguing, but decided not to. The more evidence against the a-holes who did this, the better. You probably should also swear out a protection order, he told me. He handed me a card with a name of an attorney with the local DA's office and a number. I've taken the liberty of calling her already, and she said she would meet you at the hospital, he told me. I thanked him and went with the paramedics, who gave me a brief examination on the way to the hospital. Once in the emergency room, they examined me, took samples of the stuff on my face, cleaned me up, and took blood and urine samples. They gave me some painkillers which were just starting to relax me when a well-dressed woman came into the exam room. Stan Shipman? She asked. I nodded my head. That's me, I said. Mr. Shipman, I'm Linda Calloway. I'm the assistant DA assigned to your case. How are you feeling? I've been better, kinda tired right now. They gave me something to take the pain away. Mr. Shipman, the officers who had you brought in briefed me on the situation. I've also been told the other woman and the two men who attacked you have been picked up and are now being held in county jail pending their hearing. I'm asking that they be remanded without bail, but the truth of the matter is they'll probably end up being released on their own recognizance. The company they work for has a lot of influence in the county, I'm afraid. So I've taken it upon myself to seek a protection order for you. Thank you for that. Think it'll do any good? She shrugged her shoulders. I can't say for certain, maybe. But there's no guarantee. I nodded my head. I understand, I said. If there's any consolation, they'll be in lockup at least until Monday morning when their arraignment hearing takes place after that. I get it. I'm just a regular working class stiff with no friends in high places. When push comes to shove, I'm on my own. You have me, Mr. Shipman, she said with an edge in her voice. As long as you don't do anything stupid. But you may want to retain a divorce attorney. Unless you plan on remaining married to your wife. No, I'm done with her, I said. She nodded her head in understanding. I've been told they plan to keep you overnight for observation. It's just as well, since your apartment is now a crime scene. It'll take them a while to go through everything and bag up the evidence. Do you own a gun, by the way? I shook my head. No, I don't, I told her. After my youngest brother accidentally shot himself in the leg with my dad's .22 caliber pistol, he got rid of all his guns, and I decided it would be best to not have one. Okay, just so you know, we do have castle laws in this state, so you're allowed to defend yourself in your own home. I'll keep that in mind, I said. What about drugs? Do you have any drugs in your apartment? I shook my head again. I don't, but apparently I can't say the same for my wife, I said. Okay, I'll pass that on, she said. After she left, I found myself falling asleep and woke up when they wheeled me into a private room. After they got me situated, they gave me more meds and I fell asleep for the night. The next morning, my parents came by after I finished breakfast. They sat in silence as I told them everything that happened. My father was livid when I finished. What are you going to do, son? He asked. I'm divorcing the witch, I told him. He nodded his head in approval. Good for you? Is there anything we can do? I could use the name of a good divorce lawyer, I said. I know a few people. Let me see what I can come up with. I could also use a ride home after I get discharged, I said. No problem. Just call me when you're ready. In the meantime, you get some rest and take it easy. Don't do anything stupid. You know me, I said. Yeah, I do, he said with a smile. That's why I said not to do anything stupid. We all had a good laugh, and they left after my mother gave me a hug. A little while later, Lucy's parents came by. We had always gotten along well, and they were like a second set of parents to me. I told them what happened the night before. They were both shocked and embarrassed at what their daughter had done. I take it you'll be filing for divorce, her father said. I nodded my head. Yeah, I can't live with what she's done. I understand, and I'm truly sorry. Is there anything we can do? Her mother asked. If Lucy gets out of jail, she's going to need a place to stay. The assistant DA is getting an order of protection, so she can't stay at the apartment. She can come stay with us, her mother said. Thanks, I told her. We said our goodbyes and they left. The doctor came by a couple hours later and checked me out. He declared me fit to be released and the nurses began their paperwork. I knew it would take a while, so I called my dad and let him know. My parents showed back up about the time the paperwork was done. After the nurse gave me my instructions, she put me in a wheelchair and pushed me to the loading zone where my dad's car was parked. 
They helped me get in, and we were off. Before long, we pulled up in front of the apartment. My dad helped me to the door and we said our goodbyes again. Remember, if you need anything, just call. Thanks, Dad, I said. I walked into the apartment and took a look around. The police had gone through everything, and I knew it would take a while to get things put back away. I noticed right off there was a message on our answering machine. I played the message. Dead meat, the message said. Nothing else. No introduction. Nothing. I looked and found the number was listed as private. Something about the message seemed familiar, so I listened to it a few more times. Then it dawned on me. This wasn't someone speaking directly into the phone. I recognized the phrase as a line from one of those old Rocky movies, specifically the one with Mr. T. Whoever sent the message had recorded it, then played it back over the phone. A few minutes after I figured that out, the doorbell rang. I looked through the peephole and saw a fairly young, attractive brunette standing outside. I remembered seeing her at the club the first time I met Jake. I looked, but didn't see anyone else with her. I had a brainstorm and pulled my cell phone from my shirt pocket. I activated the camera and set it to record, then placed it back in my pocket. Then, I opened the door but kept the chain connected. Yes. I asked. Mr. Shipman, she asked quietly. That's me, and you are. Holly Brinkman, I work with your wife. May I come in, please? Are you alone? I asked. Yes, I am. I closed the door long enough to disconnect the chain and opened it back up to let her inside. After she came in, I closed and locked the door. What can I do for you, Ms. Brinkman? I asked. Please call me Holly, she said. All right, Holly. Again, what can I do for you? She handed me a manila envelope. What's this? I asked. Open it, please, she said quietly. I opened the folder and glanced inside. I saw a couple of photos, so I set the envelope on the coffee table and excused myself to go to the kitchen, where I grabbed a pair of latex gloves. I didn't want to take the risk of getting my fingerprints on anything. I came back and pulled the photos out and was shocked at what I saw. The photos showed graphic shot of a dead man on his knees, his hands tied behind his back. The other photo was the same man, but from a different angle. I looked at Holly. Who is this? I asked. It was my husband, she said, tears falling down her cheeks. His name was Brian. Did you report this? I asked her. She nodded her head. Yeah, the police ruled it a suicide. How? I asked. You don't understand. The firm we work for has friends in very high and low places. They own a good part of the police force, and several judges are also on their payroll. I see. Did Jake do this? She shrugged her shoulders. I don't know. He may have ordered it. So why are you still with the firm? I asked her. I have no choice, she said. Let me guess. You're not just a legal secretary. Am I right? That's right. They did to US what Jake and Marie did to you. Except my husband went after Jake. And paid the ultimate price. So you're really just a hooker for the firm, aren't you? I asked. She nodded her head. Yes, it's my job to be available for the attorneys and their clients. What's Marie's role in all this? I asked. She's kind of like the madam. She handles all our, er, assignments. And she was adding Lucy to her stable? I asked her. Yes, she said. I looked in the envelope and saw something else. A piece of paper, folded in two. I pulled it out and opened it up. It was a note, but the letters appeared to be cut from magazines and newspapers and glued to the paper. Talk about cheesy. I nearly laughed out loud, but stifled the urge. Stan Shipman, the note began. Back off, or this could be you, it read. I looked at Holly. Did you read this? I asked her. She shook her head. No, it was dropped off at my apartment this morning with a note to hand deliver it to this address. Would you be willing to tell this to the district attorney? I asked. She shook her head. No, I'd like to keep living, if you don't mind. You have no idea how evil these people are. Especially Marie. How many people in your firm know about all this? I asked. Pretty much everyone above the mid-level executive level, she said. I nodded my head. Figures, all right. Holly, thank you for bringing this to me. I'm sorry about everything. You seem like a really great guy. Lucy's lucky to have you. Thanks for saying so, Holly. Have a good day, I added, opening the door for her. I watched as she left and made sure no one else was around. I closed and locked the door. This and the voicemail changed things dramatically. Oh, I still intended to divorce Lucy, but these threats brought everything to a whole new level. And trust me after I am down with Jack, Lucy would be praying for the Grim Reaper to take her. I ended the video and called Linda. 
Fortunately, she had written her personal cell number on the back of her card. This is Linda Calloway, she said when she answered. I told her about the voicemail and the envelope that had just been delivered. This changes everything, all right? I want you to bring that to me, right now. She gave me her address, then ended the call. I decided at that point, I needed to get the hell out of Dodge for a bit. I packed enough stuff to hold me over for a few days, then tossed it in the back seat of my F-150. I had another brainstorm and grabbed the meat cage Lucy had used on me the previous night. That, too, went into the truck. I had an idea and I wanted to explore it a bit. After putting some of my basic welding tools in my truck, I called my boss to let him know what was going on and ask for some time off, which he quickly gave me. The job's done and you have a shitload of vacation time coming anyway, so take whatever time you need and get this squared away, he said. Thanks, boss. I double-checked everything, locked the door, and headed out. I made it to Linda's condo in less than 30 minutes. She was shocked when she saw the photos and the note. I also have a video of the discussion I had with the woman who brought this. It's pretty eye-opening. Let me see it. I pulled out my phone and played the video for her. Oh my god, she gasped when the video ended. This explains a lot. Can you let me have a copy of that? I gave her the phone to let her do what needed to be done. When she finished, she handed the phone back. Then I realized I still had Lucy's phone in my pocket. I pulled it out and handed it to her. What's this? Linda asked. This is Lucy's phone. I put it in my pocket the night Jake assaulted me. I forgot all about it till now. Maybe you can find something there. I'll have our boys take a look. Then she sat back in her chair. On second thought, maybe I should get with the state or the feds on this. If what Holly said is true, I can't even trust our own police department. She looked up at me before continuing. What are you going to do? I'm getting out of town for a bit, I said. She nodded her head. What about protective custody? Maybe we should put you into a witness protection program, she said. Yeah, right. So Jake and his buddies will know exactly where I am. No thanks. All right. Just let me know where you are. Okay? Okay. I said. I headed out, not knowing where I was going. All I knew is that I had to get away from this shit for a while. I stopped at a bank and pulled out as much cash as I possibly could and drove around some more constantly keeping an eye out for any cars that might be following me around. All I could think of was those photos of that poor man who was killed because he didn't want to be cucked by Jake and Marie. I knew that if I wasn't careful, that would be me. It was late at night when it finally came to me. I pulled into a rest stop and made a call. I hoped it wasn't too late and fortunately it wasn't. Yeah, said the gruff voice at the other end of the call. Dave, it's me, Stan, I said. Dave was an old friend from way back. We had worked together on a number of jobs and got along quite well. Stan, you old son of a witch, what the hell is going on, man? I got a little problem and was wondering if I could come rack out with you for a few days, I said. Sure, buddy, come on up. Just do me a favor and pick up a couple six-packs if you wouldn't mind. No problem, buddy, see you in a few hours. See ya, he said before ending the call. Feeling better, I pulled onto the interstate and headed north. I spotted a convenience store on my way north, so I stopped and grabbed a couple six-packs of beer along with a styrofoam chest and some ice to keep it cold. I also warmed up my coffee and decided to grab a couple packs of smokes. I normally didn't smoke around the apartment, but I knew Dave smoked and thought he might appreciate the gesture. He was letting me rack out at his place for a while, after all, so I thought I owed him that much at least. Dave Brolin was about 15 years older than me and had worked with my father. That's how we met. He stayed at our place several times when he was working in our area, and he was kind of like a big brother to me. I learned a lot from him working in my dad's shop. He had it rough growing up. His father worked in the shipyards and ended up dying from complications due to mesothelioma, thanks to the asbestos he was constantly exposed to. After his father died, his baby sister, Beverly, stayed home to watch over their mother until she died a year or so ago from stomach cancer. I had known Bev for quite some time. She was a no-nonsense kind of girl, attractive in a girl-next-door sort of way. Of course, I never made a move on her partly because of Dave's friendship with me and my dad, but mostly because I was already smitten with Lucy. Bev and I got along nicely, and we were more like siblings than anything else, ribbing each other over this or that. I hadn't seen her in a while and was curious to see what she was like nowadays. Like me, Dave married young, but ended up divorced when he came home to find his wife with one of her co-workers. He never remarried, but does go out now and again. Most of his time is spent looking after Beverly, who now lives with him. Beverly, of course, would say she's watching over him. 
I pulled up in front of Dave's two-story log house about 2.30 a.m., grabbed my stuff and the ice chest, and met Dave on the front porch. I hope you got some beer in there for us, he said with a smile. After taking the pack of smokes I offered him, he opened the door and helped me get the rest of my things inside. I carried the ice chest into the kitchen and saw a gorgeous blonde coming down the stairs wearing a long t-shirt and a short pair of pajama bottoms. Who's the blonde bombshell? I asked Dave. He laughed. You know who I am, numbnuts, the blonde said. I did a double take and realized it was Beverly. She looked nothing like the gangly teenage girl I remembered. Her legs were well-toned, her breasts had gotten a bit larger, and her hair reached almost to the middle of her back. Beverly? I asked, confused. Is that really you? You know it is, dipshit, she said sarcastically. Why are you here so damn early in the morning? Lucy catch you cheating on her and throw you out or something? No, not quite, I said with an edge in my voice. Bev's face softened as she took me in. I'm sorry, Stan, she said, looking at my bruised face. What happened? Are you all right? Not really, that's why I'm here. Why don't you grab a beer and come explain it to us? Dave said. I nodded my head, grabbed three beers and headed into the front room. I handed one to Dave, then turned to Beverly. You sure you're old enough to drink? I asked her sarcastically. She smiled as she held up a middle finger and grabbed a beer out of my hands. Spill it. What's going on with you two? It's pretty embarrassing, I said. So? We're adults and we're damn near family. So out with it. Okay. I said before telling them the whole story about Lucy, Marie, and Jake. I showed them the video I took of my brief meeting with Holly. They sat, shocked into silence, when I finished. Damn, Dave said after he took a swig of his beer. Do you think they know where you're now? I don't think so. I didn't see any cars follow me up here anyway. Well, fortunately, we're on top of this hill, and we can see anyone heading up here. And I still have the guns I bought from your dad after Mikey's accident. You still remember how to shoot, don't you? I nodded my head. Yeah, but I haven't touched a gun since that happened, I said. My younger brother, Michael, or Mikey, as everyone called him, accidentally shot himself in the leg with my dad's .22 caliber pistol years ago. Mikey only suffered a minor flesh wound and recovered just fine, but my dad felt so bad about it that he got rid of all his guns and never replaced them. That's all right. I'll take you out back and let you get familiar with them. Biff can work with you as well. She's gotten to be a pretty decent shot. I looked at Beverly, surprised. She sat up a bit and gave me a wicked smile. Does your dad know you're up here? Dave asked me. I shook my head. No, I haven't told anyone where I'm at. I need to let the assistant DA know, though. You have to remember, I didn't even think about coming up here until I had already left. Okay, I'll call your parents and let them know this morning after the sun comes up. Don't use your cell phone if you can help it. In fact, it might be a good idea to turn your phone off and remove the battery, just in case there's some kind of tracker on it. Good idea, I said, turning the phone off. I popped the back off and removed the battery. So Lucy and her friends are going before the judge on Monday? Beverly asked. Yes. The arraignment is on Monday, the DA is hoping the judge holds them without bail, but after what I heard from Holly, I'm not so sure that'll happen. Well, you're welcome to stay here as long as you need to. I have a job to get to a week from Monday, and I'll be gone for a week, but if you need to hang around, that's okay. How much time are you taking off? I was planning on two weeks, I'm hoping this gets squared away by then. Like I said, you're welcome to rack out here, Dave said. Thanks, I appreciate that. If there's anything I can do to help, let me know. Dave looked at Beverly, then smiled. I'm sure Bev can think of a thing or two, but you're a guest here and your folks always treated us like royalty, so you can kick back and enjoy the country air as far as I'm concerned. Well, guys, this has been fun, but I have to get up and make breakfast in a few hours, Beverly said, standing up. I hope you like omelets and hash browns, cause that's what I'm fixing, she added, looking at me. Breakfast of champions, sounds great to me. She waved and headed upstairs. After I heard her bedroom door close, Dave and I went out back to smoke a cigarette and talk. What's the story with her, anyway? I asked. I figured she'd be married and raising kids by now. Well, she never met anyone she really cared for. She dated a few guys, but she said they just didn't measure up. Measure up? To what? I asked. He looked at me seriously. To you, numbnuts, she's always had a major crush on you. No way. I said, shocked. Absolutely, the only reason she never told you was because of Lucy. She didn't want to be the reason you two split up. Are you serious? As a heart attack, he said. What makes you think she's still got a crush on me? I asked. 
I've heard her call your name out more than once at night. That's just a bit too much information, I said. Dave smiled and took a sip of his beer. Well, it is what it is. So when did Beverly turn into a babe? She's always been a pretty girl. She just never flaunted it. Besides, you only had eyes for Lucy, remember? Yeah, I do. Look, between you and me, I'd be more than okay with you two getting together. Just do me a favor, will ya? What's that? Don't break her heart. I love my sister, and I think you do, too, if you think about it. I just don't want to see her get her hopes up, then watch you and Lucy reconcile. That would destroy her. I shook my head. I'm done with Lucy. All right, well, I'd better get my butt to bed. See you later this morning. He stood up, ground out his cigarette in the can he had set up, and headed upstairs. I finished my cigarette and went to bed a few minutes later. I was asleep the minute my head hit the pillow. I woke up later when Beverly opened the door and yelled at me to rise and shine. I wiped the sleep from my eyes and noticed it was 8.30. I went into the bathroom and did my morning routine, then took a quick shower, dressed, and headed downstairs. I looked at the ring on my finger as I got dressed and pulled it off, tossing it on the dresser. I saw Beverly in the kitchen making breakfast when I got downstairs. She was wearing a short t-shirt and a pair of cutoff shorts. Her long hair was pulled back into a ponytail and her blonde bangs fell over her forehead. She was a vision of loveliness, and I wondered why I hadn't seen it before. That smells good, I said. She smiled. I'm glad you think so, cowboy. Coffee's already made if you want some. You still like butter pecan creamer? Sure do. You got some? Oh yeah, in the fridge. Help yourself. Just save some for Dave and I. I poured a cup of coffee and added some creamer. I love southern butter pecan. Thanks to my dad. Dave got hooked on it when my dad brought some onto a job site. Go ahead and have a seat, she told me with a smile. I'll have it done in just a minute. I took a seat at the table where Dave had already sat down, reading the Sunday paper. Morning, I said. He looked at me over the paper. Morning, he said in response. Anything interesting in the news? Yeah, a piece here in the paper about some fancy lawyer getting arrested for various charges. Take a look, he added, handing me the article. The article didn't mention any names, nor did it give much in the way of specifics. It was pretty much boilerplate news, drivel that wouldn't mean anything to anyone who didn't know the whole story. I grunted and handed the paper back. By then, Bev had finished making breakfast and was bringing it to the table on a cart. This is delicious, I said as I took a big bite. Thank you, kind sir, Beverly said with a smile. I'm glad you approve. We finished our breakfast and Dave stood up after he cleaned his plate. I have to run into town and get some things. I'll be gone for at least a couple hours. If you need to call the DA, you can use the house phone. Thanks, I said. Beverly handed him a list of things she needed and he stuffed it in his pocket. He grabbed his keys and headed out. I looked at Beverly. You need some help clearing the dishes? I asked. I don't necessarily need it, but it would be appreciated. Thanks for asking. I got up and helped her clear the table. She tossed me a towel and began washing the dishes already in the sink. I see you're not wearing your ring. Are you actually going to divorce her? Yeah. I told her I wouldn't stand for any cheating, and I meant it. Good, she said with a slight smile. I'm glad to see you still have some balls. What's your story? How's things with you? She shrugged her shoulders. Okay, I guess. Anyone special in your life these days? I asked. There was once, but he was taken. Besides, I wouldn't have been able to pursue a relationship anyway. Too busy taking care of my parents. That's what I heard. Yeah, well, it had to be done. After dad died, mom needed my help. I worked as a waitress to help bring in some money, since all she had was dad's 401k and some social security. I worked until she was too sick to do anything, then stayed home and took care of her full time. I'm sorry to hear that. Don't be. I don't regret staying home with her. I just hope when I'm at her age, someone will be around to help me out. So, what happened? I asked. After mom died, there wasn't much left. We had to sell the house and a lot of her stuff. Between what was left of dad's pension and 401k, we managed to pay off all her final expenses. There was a little bit left over, and Dave let me have it since I took care of her. He promised mom he'd let me stay here with him, and this is where I've been ever since. Dave offered to pay for me to go to college, but I turned him down. Why? I asked. I don't want to be beholden to anyone. I want to make it on my own steam if I can. So I stay here and work at the McDonald's in town. I make enough to cover my expenses and I'm taking a few business courses at night. Good for you, I said. Yeah, well, Dave has this idea about starting his own fabrication business 
and he mentioned having me do the accounting and stuff, she said. He's still talking about that? Yeah, he does a lot of one-off things for folks around here. Custom barbecue grills, trailers, that sort of thing. Gets pretty good money doing it. His dream is to stay home and work out of his shop out back. Maybe he'll show it to you while you're here. That would be nice. We fell quiet and I found myself admiring her. For the first time, I realized how beautiful she really was, and not just on the outside. She glanced at me before saying anything. What are you looking at? She asked. I think I'm looking at the most beautiful woman I've ever met. I told her. I thought I saw a tear form in her eye. Stop teasing me, she said quietly, looking down. I'm not. I can't help but admire you. You put your own life on hold for your parents. You refuse to accept Dave's offer to put you through college, and you're working your own way through school. I'm just sorry I didn't notice it before now. Well, you were blinded by Lucy, so I can't really hold that against you, she said. Yeah, I guess you're right. Having washed all the dishes, she drained the water in the sink, dried her hands, and turned to me. She used you, you know, Bev said. I think you're right. Of course I'm right. I saw through her years ago. Why didn't you say anything? I asked. You wouldn't have believed me. I realized she was probably right. Hell, she could do no wrong in your eyes. She had you wrapped so tight around her little finger you would have done anything for her. All I wanted to do was keep her happy. And look where that got you. She got her degree, her new car, all kinds of baubles and trinkets and clothes, all on your dime. Then when she didn't need you anymore, she traded you in for a new model. I'm glad she's in jail, cause if she were here right now, I'd rip her a new a-hole. I believe you would. I just want to know one thing, she said, her hands on her hips. What's that? I asked. Are you going to fall for her tears and take her back? She asked. I shook my head. No, I said. That ship has sailed. After Friday, that's not going to happen. Good, she said. And in case you have second thoughts, remember this. She pulled her t-shirt over her head and tossed it on the floor, revealing herself bare to me for the first time. She stripped, walked to me and put her arms around me giving me the deepest tongue kiss I had ever experienced. We made love. I love you, Stan Shipman. I've always loved you. Don't ever forget that. I'll be your woman for as long as you want me. I love you too, Beverly. I want to stay like this for the rest of my life. That sounds nice, but I don't think my brother would appreciate that, she said jokingly. I laughed, then kissed her deeply. Then it hit me. I looked at her, concerned. I just realized I didn't use any protection. Don't worry about it. I'm on the pill. Besides, I wouldn't mind if you got me pregnant. I'd love to have your children. I'm going to hold you to that. We'd better get cleaned up before Dave gets back. I have to put out the meat for tonight, so why don't you run up and take a quick shower? Okay? I'll be up in a bit. Okay, what's up with the meat? We like to barbecue on Sundays, weather permitting. You like venison, don't you? Yeah, I love venison, but it's been years since I had any. Good. I shot at myself with Dave's .50 caliber flintlock. Even dressed it in the field with my own two hands. My, you are quite the woman, the rugged outdoors a type. I'm truly impressed. I had seen Dave's flintlock and knew it had to be at least 49 inches long. Did you load it yourself? I asked her. Of course, patched round ball with 100 grains of double F powder. Even molded the bullet myself. Damn, do you like fishing as well? She smiled. I love to go fishing. I even bait my own hooks and clean my own fish. Is there anything you haven't done? I asked sarcastically. I haven't rebuilt the transmission in Dave's truck. Yet. I did help him rebuild his engine, though. I am definitely in love, I told her, giving her a kiss. She kissed me back. Now, hurry, run upstairs and grab a quick shower. I'll be up in a bit. I headed up and jumped in the shower. A few minutes later, Beverly joined me. Just wait till tonight when we go to bed. By the way, you're sleeping with me from now on. My bed's a lot bigger than the one in your room. Won't Dave get upset? I asked. Nope. Besides, we're both consenting adults. After our shower, we dressed and headed back downstairs. I need to call the DA and let her know where I'm at, I said. Bev pointed to a wireless phone set sitting in its cradle. Go ahead and use that phone. I picked up the phone and called, nearly forgetting that it was long distance. Linda picked up the phone after the second ring. Linda Calloway, she said. Linda, this is Stan Shipman. I just called to let you know where I'm at. Stan, thank God you called. I was starting to get worried. I see you're calling long distance. Where are you? I'm with an old friend of the family. I've turned off my cell phone just to be safe. Okay, I'll keep you in the loop as much as possible. I've already heard from the feds. 
Seems they're looking into the firm your wife works for. By the way, I took the liberty of talking to an old friend of mine who just happens to be the best damn divorce lawyer in the area. I hope you don't mind. No, I don't. Good. She's expecting to hear from you tomorrow. I told her a little bit about your situation. If anyone can deal with this, she can. Thanks. I'll do that. Linda gave me the information I needed and promised to let me know how things went at the arraignment before we ended the call. By then, Dave had returned so I went out to help him carry in what he had bought. By the way, he said when we finished. I called your folks. They were pretty concerned about you. I told them you were staying with us for a while. Thanks. That night, we barbecued the meat and enjoyed a nice dinner outside on their deck. After dinner, we all pitched in and cleaned up. Dave and I grabbed a beer and headed out for a smoke as Beverly finished up. Bev, tell me you're going to be sleeping in her room, Dave said. Is this going to be a permanent thing? I felt a bit uncomfortable discussing this with him. She was his sister, after all. I think so. You think? Yeah, it is. I just have to get my divorce out of the way. Do you love her? He asked. Yeah, I do. Good. It's about time you got your head out of here, but he added with a smile. Look. Bev's a big girl and can make her own decisions. She can definitely take care of herself. I just don't want to see her get hurt. That's all. I'd never hurt her. I'm glad to hear that. Welcome to the family, he added, extending his hand. I took it, and we heartily shook each other's hands. Just don't keep me up all night, okay? I laughed as I nodded my head. I'll do my best. That night, after Bev and I made love in her bed, I held her close to me and considered our possible future together. I felt more content right then than I had in a very long time. What you thinking about? She asked quietly. The future. Oh, she asked. Yeah, I mean, what do you want out of life? Where do you see yourself in, say, five or ten years? I know it's popular for women nowadays to want to break through the glass ceiling and reach for the brass rings, she said. But I'm not like that. I'm not looking for a career or anything like that. All I want is a faithful husband who loves me as much as I love him and a family to care for. That's all. What about your classes? That's mostly for Dave's benefit. When he gets his business going, he's going to need help. What about you? What do you want out of life? I guess I'm a lot like you. All I really want is a faithful wife who loves me as much as I love her and a family of my own. I thought I had that with Lucy, but that didn't work out. What about your job? She asked. I love what I do for a living, sometimes. It takes me away for a couple weeks at a time, though. Can you deal with that? She laughed. Please, my brother's a welder same as you, remember? I know what to expect. I can deal with anything as long as I know you're coming back home to me. I looked at her for a few moments before saying anything. I wish I had met you before I met Lucy, I said. Me too, but what's done is done. We'll get through this together, okay? We're a team, and we can do anything so long as we're together. I'll always be here for you, no matter what. I love you so much, I said, kissing her. I love you more, she said wrapping her arm around me. I fell asleep, feeling truly loved for the first time in ages. The next day, Beverly was up before the rest of us. After she made breakfast, she scampered upstairs to get ready for work. She gave me a kiss on her way out, letting me know she had school that night after her shift. I'm usually home by 9.30, so you guys will have to fend for yourselves, remember? No matter what happens, I love you, and I'm here for you. I love you too, I said, returning her kiss. She had no idea how much it meant to hear her say that. What? Don't I get a kiss too? He added with a smile. Beverly laughed and gave him a sisterly peck on the cheek. You two try to stay out of trouble, okay? She asked as she left. I need to call that divorce lawyer Linda recommended to me, I said, looking at the clock. Dave motioned to the phone, so I picked it up and called. Law office of Bernice Goodwin, said a friendly female voice at the other end. I introduced myself and asked if Bernice was available letting the receptionist know that she was expecting my call. Ms. Goodwin is expecting your call, sir, the woman said. One moment, please. I heard some music on the phone for a few moments before another woman answered. Bernice Goodwin, the woman said. How may I help you? This is Stan Shipman. Linda Calloway gave me your number and said I should call you this morning. Ah, uh, yes, Mr. Shipman. Linda told me some of what's going on and I've been expecting your call. Normally, I like my first meeting to be in person, but I understand that's not possible this time around. That's okay. We can do most of this online nowadays. Please, tell me your story and leave nothing out. I spent some time explaining the situation and she patiently listened. What are your expectations? She asked when I finished. I want as much as I can, no alimony, and at least my share of our assets. 
I think we can do that. Your wife facing criminal charges should strengthen your case. I will need to see your financials, though. Do you own any property, a house, anything like that? No, we live in an apartment, I said. What about action against Marie and Jake? Alienation of affection suits are allowed in this state. But I have to tell you, they usually don't go very far. You'd probably be better off suing for intentional affliction of emotional distress. Do what you feel is right, I said. All right, I'll take a closer look at this and get things rolling. Do you have an email address? Yes, I do. Good, I'll send you some documents. One of them is a contract I'll need you to electronically sign and return. The other is a checklist of things to do. Take care of that for me, please. I'll also need you to pay a retainer. Can you do that today? Yes. Good. I'll get this stuff sent out to you and once everything is ready, I'll have the paper served, she said. Any questions so far? No questions. I gave her my email address before she transferred me to her assistant who took down my credit card information. After I got off the phone, I fired up my laptop and checked my email. Sure enough, there was an email from Bernice, complete with two attached documents. I opened the contract, electronically signed it, and sent it back with a receipt so I could see that she got it. There was also a document advising me of how to protect myself financially. Thank God for internet banking, I thought. It took me a while, but I managed to open a new account for myself, transferring half of our savings and checking into it. I paid off and canceled Lucy's credit card, but kept mine open since I just paid my retainer with it. It was early afternoon by the time I finished doing everything, so Dave took me out to his shop where he was working on a trailer for one of the farmers in the area. I worked with him for a while and found it to be somewhat relaxing to keep myself busy. About 3 o'clock that afternoon, we got a call. Dave answered the phone, using the extension in his shop, and handed the receiver to me. It's that lawyer of yours, he said. This is Stan, I said after taking the receiver. Stan, Linda Calloway here, bad news. The judge gave all of them the smallest bail possible and let them go. How is that possible? I asked. He's probably on their payroll. Fortunately, the protection order is in place, but I'm afraid that's about as good as the paper it's written on. It's best you stay put. Don't come into town. The feds are keeping an eye on them for now, but I can't guarantee your safety. Terrific, I said. So what do we do now? You stay where you are. I'll do everything I can from this end. Call me if you need anything, okay? Yeah, okay. I said. We ended the call and I handed Dave the receiver back. Bad news? He asked. Yeah, the judge let them go. Crap, I'd better call your folks and let them know. I think that's a good idea. I should probably be the one to tell them. Dave nodded his head and handed the receiver back to me. I dialed the number and my father answered on the second ring. Dad, it's me, Stan, I said. How are you doing, son? He asked. I'm doing okay. I just wanted to let you know the judge let Lucy and her friends go free. You might want to be on the lookout. Something tells me they might pay you a visit to find out where I'm at. Don't worry, son. We won't tell them anything. You still down at John Harrison's place? The question surprised me, since he already knew where I was at. John Harrison was a retired foreman my dad and I had worked for in the past. After he retired, he and his wife moved to a place about two hours south of town. Then it hit me, Lucy and her friends were probably there right now looking for me. I decided to play along with the ruse. Actually, I'm in a motel about 50 miles south of there, I told him. Okay, just so long as you're okay. I'm fine. I'll be leaving here in the morning, though. I plan to head east. Just let me know where you are. Okay, son. He asked. Yeah, sure. Can I talk to mom? Uh, she's busy in the bathroom right now, my dad said. I listened carefully and thought I heard noises in the background. Okay, tell her I'm okay, and I love her. I will, son, my dad said. I could hear the strain in his voice and prayed he would be safe. Talk to you soon, okay? Will do, dad. Love you. I love you too, son, he said before the call ended. I looked at Dave and placed another call. What's up, Stan? Linda said when she answered her phone. I think Lucy and her friends are at my parents' house, I told her. Okay, I'll get a couple federal agents and head over there right now. Stay put. We ended the call and I handed the phone back to Dave. What's going on, he asked. I think Lucy and her buds are at my parents' house trying to find out where I'm at, I said. Yeah, I heard what you told your father. You think they'll buy the ruse? I hope so, at least for a few hours anyway. I knew that we had maybe six to eight hours at most if they went south to John's place. Maybe I'd better head out and find some place to hide until this blows over. No, we're in this together. You stay put. Let me get cleaned up a bit, and I'll head into town, 
Talk to the sheriff. Don't go anywhere. You hear me? I nodded my head. A couple hours later, he left the house and headed into town. After he left, Linda called back. Stan, you were right. Lucy, Marie, Jake, and a couple of their thugs went there after the hearing. They tied your folks up and threatened them. They said they didn't reveal your whereabouts. We've got an APB out for them right now. They left one of their goons here and he's in custody right now. Of course he isn't talking. Do you know where they're going? I asked. No, I don't. But I don't think they bought your story. Here, talk to your father. A few seconds later, my dad was on the phone. Stan, I don't think they bought the ruse, he said. Are you guys okay? I asked. Yeah, we're okay now. But I think Lucy and her friends are heading your way, he said. What makes you think that? I overheard Lucy talking. Okay, let Linda know so she can call the sheriff here. Will do, son. You be careful, here? I will, dad, I said. The next voice on the phone was Linda's. Where are you, exactly? I told her where I was and gave directions. Do you think Lucy knows where that is? She knows. All right, you stay put. We'll get someone out there as fast as we can. We ended the call and I headed back to the house. As I left the shop, I heard a familiar voice. It was Jake. Well, well? Thought you could outsmart us, did you? Nice try, telling your folks you were going south when you were really up north. Fortunately for us, Lucy knew this would be where you would go. Now, move, he added, waving a handgun at me. Get in, he said, motioning to a black SUV. I got in the back and saw Lucy looking at me with a smirk. Thought you could outsmart us, did you? She asked with a smirk. This isn't going to end well for you. Lucy, the cops will be here before long. No matter, it'll be too late for you. You should have just gone along with the program. Now you're going to pay the price. Marie and Jake snickered at that. Jake told the goon with him to drive down to a spot along the creek bed at the bottom of the hill. When we got there, Jake opened my door and motioned for me to get out with his gun. So, you plan to murder me, is that it? I asked Lucy. She laughed. You know what they say, dead men tell no tales, she said. Jake and Marie laughed as the goon zip tied my arms behind my back. When he was done, he forced me to my knees. First things first, you know, I've always wanted to have sex in the great outdoors. What about it, Lucy? You up to giving your soon-to-be-deceased husband one last show? Something to send him off with. What the hell, she said, stripping off her clothes. Come over here and do me, baby. Jake snickered and pulled his pants down. Just think, Stan, while your corpse is rotting here in the creek, Jake is going to be doing me every day. I'm going to enjoy spending your money and playing the role of the grieving widow. She spread her legs and Jake began doing her. The goon holding me down snickered. Enjoy it, he whispered. It'll be the last thing you ever see. I turned my head and refused to watch Lucy and Jake running like animals on the ground. Personally, I hoped the two of them would end up eaten by chiggers. It would serve them right. I told you Lucy would be broadening her horizons, Marie said. You might as well enjoy the show. It'll be the last time you ever get to see your wife. After about a half hour, Jake was done. After catching his breath, he got up and pulled his trousers back on. I looked at Lucy. Why? I asked her. Why did you do it? She shrugged her shoulders. What can I say? She asked rhetorically. He's richer than you, and he is bigger than you. Besides, I don't want to be married to a welder for the rest of my life. I want the good life, and Jake can give it to me. Are you two through reminiscing? Jake asked. We have business to tend to, and it's getting late. He motioned to the thug, who forced me to bend forward. Jake, meanwhile, had gone to the SUV and returned with a longsword. I'm sure you know what's going to happen next, old friend. Don't worry. I'm told death is pretty much instantaneous. You won't feel a thing. Now, make your peace with God, a hole. I closed my eyes and said a silent prayer. I could see Jake's shadow and knew he had lifted the sword over his head. Then I heard it, a rifle shot. As I watched, I saw Jake's body fall to the ground, a bullet hole in his forehead. His eyes were still open, but I knew he was dead. Another shot rang out, and the goon went down as well, blood pouring from his chest. Marie tried to grab Jake's gun, but another shot rang out and she went down, screaming, having been struck in the shoulder. Lucy looked around, scared, and tried to take cover behind Jake. I heard the telltale sound of a four-wheeler in the background, and I knew it was heading toward us. I tried looking to see who it was, but all I saw was a cloud of dust as it came closer. Then it was on us, and I could see the long blonde hair flowing behind the driver. I knew it was Beverly. She stopped the four-wheeler and jumped off, a scoped hunting rifle in her hand. 
She pulled a large knife from her belt and cut the zip tie securing my hands. After I was free, I sat up and watched as she ran over to Lucy. She smacked Lucy as hard as she could across the face with the butt of her rifle, sending her reeling on her back. Don't you ever touch my man again, or I swear to God I'll blow your stupid head off. Beverly yelled. You understand me, witch? I said, do you understand me, witch? Lucy nodded her head slowly. Beverly then brought down the butt on her kneecap with thunder. I heard it crack. Lucy screamed in pain. We heard sirens in the distance, so Beverly went to the four-wheeler and pulled out a flare gun. She pointed it toward the sky and fired off a flare to let the cops know where she was. Soon, we saw flashing lights heading our way. Are you okay, sweetie? She asked when she came over to me. I am now. You saved my life. I'll never be able to repay you for this. Trust me, you'll have the rest of your life to make it up to me, she said with a smile. Soon, we found ourselves surrounded by police cars. Dave pulled up in his truck and got out to check up on us. One of the deputies called for an ambulance and the coroner. Are you okay? Dave asked when he came up to us. I am now. Thanks to Bev, she saved my life. The sheriff took our statements and oversaw the rest of the operation. By now, an ambulance arrived and paramedics were looking after Marie and Lucy. She murdered Jake and Ronnie, Marie cried out. Aren't you going to arrest her? Nope, the sheriff said. This is Dave's property and we have a castle doctrine here. Miss Brolin was well within her rights to defend Mr. Shipman's life. Consider yourself lucky she didn't kill you as well. As I watched, deputies handcuffed Lucy and led her away. The sheriff informed me he was charging her and Marie with attempted murder and conspiracy to commit murder. After the officers gathered the evidence and hauled the bodies away, we were turned loose. I rode the four-wheeler with Beverly back to the house. I thought you had classes today. What happened? Dave came by McDonald's and told me what happened, so I clocked out and came on back home. I had to make sure you were all right. I saw the tire tracks in the grass and followed them down to where you were, so I got into a deer stand I have set up and... Well, you know the rest. When I saw what Jake was going to do, I just reacted. I'll make up the class. Don't worry. I'm not worried. I'm grateful. More than you'll ever know. I grabbed the phone and called Linda to let her know what happened. She was relieved to hear I was okay. After this, we have them right where we want them. Don't worry. The firm is going down. Hard. I hope the hell so. After that, I called my parents to let them know what happened. They were also glad to hear things turned out well for us. That night, I thanked Beverly profusely for saving my life. Marie recovered from her wounds and both her and Lucy stood trial for attempted murder and conspiracy to commit murder. They were found guilty and convicted of charges related to my initial assault and illegal detention. Both were given a life sentence and faced even more charges related to conspiracies and racketeering by the firm. I only saw them twice in that whole time, once when Bev and I were called to testify and again when they were sentenced. Both times, they looked like shit and I couldn't help but smile. The bottom line was that neither of them would ever breathe free air again. And I couldn't be happier. In the meantime, Beatrice pushed the divorce through and because of Lucy's convictions, convinced a judge to give her nothing. She also got a hefty settlement against Marie as well as Jake's estate. By the time she was finished, I was rolling in money. Oh yeah, Bernice got a portion of it, but I was very happy with my take. The firm also settled for a very large amount of money, since the partners were defending themselves against numerous federal charges, including racketeering and charges related to the mysterious deaths of two other men. By the time it was all said and done, the firm was forced to close shop and the partners found themselves behind bars for life. All that took place in a period of about six months. By the time it was over, I had more than enough for Beverly and I to live on for years. I bought a nice ring for her and proposed to her properly, on one knee. She squealed and smothered me with kisses. A month or so later, we were married and spent a week in Las Vegas. When we got back, we sat Dave down in the living room and made our proposal. His eyes went wide as we suggested the formation of DNS welding and custom fabrications. Are you serious? He asked us. Hell yeah, I said. Beverly pulled out her spreadsheet and showed him the business plan she made up. After he looked it over carefully, he sat back. You know, I think this just might work. Oh, by the way, I almost forgot, he added, reaching into his pocket. He pulled out a set of keys and handed them to us. You know that lot over on the south side? Yeah, what about it? Did you see that new double wide sitting on it? He asked. Yeah, we thought you sold that lot off. Nope, that's your wedding present. From me and your parents, he added, looking at me. 
It's brand spanking new and has all the latest goodies. The lot and the home is registered in your name, by the way. Your dad and I have already moved your stuff into it from your apartment, except for anything with Lucy's picture on it, of course. Wow, I don't know what to say. Of course, I could afford to build a custom home, but the double wide was nice and just as sturdy as a stick home. I certainly wasn't going to look a gift horse in the mouth. I knew the place had to cost them well over $150,000. Say thanks, partner, holding his hand out. I smiled and grabbed his hand. We ended up in a manly bear hug. Will you be okay with us down there? Beverly asked. I'd hate to see you alone. I'll be just fine, he said. Besides, I'll finally get a decent night's sleep. I'm getting tired of hearing you two moan all night long. We celebrated that night, and I called my parents to thank them for the present as well. Later that evening, Beverly and I christened the master bedroom. Yes, I thought as we laid there in each other's arms, things were going to work out well. You know with money comes a lot of friends and some of these friends have more friends who have some serious friends behind the bars. Lucy and Marie were having a real bad time behind the bars. They had to clean the toilets, I must add with their toothbrushes, and they had to give favors to a lot of inmates who had special preferences. I guess Marie and Lucy will have a wider horizon soon. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comment section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.